when we recite these sutras and uh, different sutras different tune the rhythm why it is necessary certain uh, tunes are very important for the human mind for soothing to calm the human mind not only words the rhythm is very important and certain sutras the tune appeal to devas and certain rhythms influence other living beings like animals a snake some others influence invisible non human beings such as spirits or ghosts to influence them influence means to avoid their disturbances the rhythm is important there are some birds snakes they are very keen to listen certain rhythm you know the snake charmers uh, by listening their wing the snake the cobra you know according to that rhythm also turn the boat in this way and this way and that way follow the rhythm snakes like certain rhythm birds so simply by uttering this word you cannot influence the the rhythm is very important in every religion there is some sort of uh, rhythm when you listen to the quran reading Oh, very soothing the voice and the rhythm of course you know people have religious prejudices therefore some people don't like to appreciate ah that is yeah. this is our human weakness but listen unbiasedly i really enjoy that that rhythm you know the way how they recite very carefully the pronunciation is a very very difficult for us to uh, pronounce because the arabic language at the rhythm is really then uh, veda chanting by hindu priest veda mantra chantings by hindu also there is another rhythms very pleasing in sanskrit language they recite all their uh, religious verses and the buddhist also started this paritta chanting they have their own rhythm especially the dhamma chakra sutra the first sermon of the buddha then mahasamaya sutra the assembly of devas another rhythm then atanatya Uh, to influence the evil spirits uh, that rhythm is very rough and tough uh, this is the advice given by the buddha he says there are some uh, spirits who never obey who never listen never surrender if you talk to them smoothly they don't listen you have to raise your voice shout at them the that sound vibration creates to influence their mind to calm you see in atanati sutta there are few word <coughs> ujjhapetabba vikkanditabba viravitabba now this word you see Raise your voice. 
and pronounce the word louder, create sound vibration as a force. Now this is a psychological approach. This we can understand. When you talk to our children nicely, they don't care, they don't listen. Uh, then you raise your voice and shout. Uh, these are human beings. And certain uh, spirits or devils or yakkas are very stubborn. They come to see the Buddha also, group by group. And the Buddha says how they behave. Some of them just come to the Buddha and say, Hello, how are you? That's all. Sit down. Some others just come, hmm, sit down. No talk, no respect. Some others just come and sit down. No talk, nothing. So proud. And some come and be respect and sit down. After listening to his discourses and they, some of them behave in the same way. Some of them just get up and walk up. No need, doesn't want to see the face also. And some others thank him and pay respect. Uh, you see, when you read uh, Arta Anatiya Sutta, you can say, Appe katche tunhi bhuta tatthe vantradhan. Tunhi bhuta. Just quietly walk out without saying even that. <laughs> so this is the nature. There are some human beings also when they come here. They also behave exactly like them. <laughs> there is no difference, you know, sometimes you can see. So then, what is there actually for us to use as the power or the authority to influence others, to protect others, simply by chanting these sutras. Still people cannot understand. First thing, our mind. Now when we recite this for others, at that time, directly we have to focus our mind towards that particular person or group of people. If you go on thinking some other things while reciting this one, they don't experience, the, because the, the mental vibration and sound vibration, both are important. Sound alone cannot uh, influence. Now when you recite a mantra, actually you do not know what you recite. And you never divert your compassion, kindness, but some people do that. So, the mental attitude is important. Second aspect, people have not learned this thing. Why it is necessary for us to recite one particular stanza or sutra for so many times, again and again and again and again, say seven times, or 108 times, or twenty-one times, uh, these uh, numbers, they have given, but there is some sort of hidden meaning. Why only seven times? If not, why only twenty-one times? If not, why only hundred and eight times? The numbers give different meaning, but it is not in the religious language. Now take, for instance, you take glass of water. 
and recite. When you recite, you have to concentrate, you have to divert your mind. For what purpose, to whom you are doing this, or for you or for others. And you do not know how much mental energy you impart into this glass of water. These energies accumulate in the water. The more you recite, and this will become more effective. Now that is the meaning of the recital of so many times. The more you recite, the so much the better. Again, for you, when you recite for you, while reciting, you calm your own mind. Because at that time you develop your devotion, your confidence, and you do not allow some other sources to come and disturb the mind. So some sort of calmness there in the mind. Very difficult to develop this mind up to that extent. Therefore chanting is very important to concentrate, to calm the mind, and to avoid rubbish evil thoughts, and to protect us from various external sources. The mind and the sound vibration both work together. Then assume, now I am going to chant for you, and you just listen, but your minds are running here and there. And then you won't be able to experience uh, good results. You had to divert your mind towards this sound, this recital. I had to divert my mind towards you. And then this relationship, communication, create the effect. The more you concentrate, the more you develop your devotion and confidence, the more you experience the good result. Another aspect. When you analyze these words that we recite, all are meaningful words. Every word convey some sort of virtues, qualities, good qualities, wisdom, kindness, compassion, all are virtuous. Then the power of the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. What is this power? But still people cannot understand what sort of power is there. The Buddha, by developing, cultivating, accumulating all the great virtues, knowledge and wisdom and enlightenment, developed this bala, this power, this energy. And this power never disappeared. The power that he had generated never disappeared. His physical body disappeared. Take a very simple example. The man who has discovered this electricity, uh, he used his knowledge and wisdom. The one who has discovered this is no more. But his wisdom uh, still remains. This brightness today we are enjoying because of that wisdom. Atomic energy 
discovered by those scientists. They, had, they were dead and gone, but the energy must remain forever. It is up to us to use this either for constructive or destructive purpose, that is our mistake. When they wanted to discover, they never had such ulterior motive that they want to misuse this energy for destructive purpose. And later we have diverted this to create a lot of disasters, destruction. So the wisdom and the enlightenment and the power discovered, revealed, radiated by the Buddha never disappeared. So every time when we remember him, when we respect him, when we develop confidence in him, when we recite the word uttered by him, uh, that power is still working. Then the Dhamma. What is Dhamma? Dhamma is justice and peace and truth and reality. This is called Dhamma. These are the most powerful thing in this world, the power of the truth. Now when you develop your compassion, it is the power of the Dhamma is there. And that power again protects you in return. So when you develop your sincerity, without bluffing others. You do not know, you develop a lot of power in you. Some people may try to swindle you, but many others respect you, honor you. They don't suspect you when they come to know that you are an honest man. They respect you. Ah, this is the power of this time. When people come to know that you never harm another person, you are a harmless person, then people never suspect you. They love you, they like you, they never disturb you. Uh, that is the power of the Dhamma. So people cannot understand these things. Therefore, for everything they refer to God, but when you define this word, God, again we have to come back to the same qualities and virtues. That's why, according to their interpretation also, the God is within you. God is not somewhere else. Uh, that means you are the power, confidence, devotion, the virtues that you have developed, uh, God is within you not somewhere else. When this question was put to the Buddha, where is Nirvana? Ah, he has given the same answer. Nirvana is not somewhere else, it is in your mind. When your mind is completely pure, ah, you enjoy that Nirvana in your mind, you do not know that. It is Nirvana. But we create our own imagination according to our lack of understanding. That we want to go there, we want to enjoy. This our normal human man's way of thinking, human being's way of thinking. Then the power of the Sangha. Sangha does not mean one particular monk, or not even those monks who exist today. When we respect, pay homage to the monks, we pay homage to the Sangha community from Sariputta, Muggallana, Ananda, Kasyapa, Rahula, 
the, from the nearest disciples of the Buddha and who have developed all the great virtues who have attained sainthood, arahanta and nirvana. That sangha community we take as sangha, not individual person. So we, they have protected the Dhamma, imparted this knowledge to others, guided others as custodian, otherwise no Dhamma today. So while serving others, they also served themselves by cultivating the, the virtues and the good qualities. By neglecting themselves, they cannot serve others. And they also should not be so selfish to serve to themselves. Or, I want only my own peace and happiness. I don't want to be bothered to go and preach and teach and work with the others. Now, that attitude is not very correct. But there are a certain monks who don't like Leave them alone, let them have that freedom in their mind. Now this is the historical background. Then <coughs> these chanting sessions, all night chanting especially, only in one place during the Buddha's time he has advised a group of monks to go and chant the sutras the whole night, only in one place. Uh, the reason is many of those astrologers and some others having seen certain indications predicted that this child won't last long. The parents were worrying about this. I reported to the Buddha. They say this child cannot live long. But he has seen the Buddha. What is happening? If it is due to a very bad karma that this person has committed during his previous birth, the Buddha also cannot change it. No one can change it. Because the Buddha also had to face some of them. Nearest disciples also had to face. No one can stop. But certain karmas, now this is also very important, Certain karmas are not very strong. By using virtues and good qualities and compassion in our mind, the mental vibrations and the virtues that we develop can topple this minor karma, the reaction. It does not mean that we can abolish, eradicate completely. We can stop for the time being or within this lifetime. So this kind of chanting or meditation, recitals, uh, work to protect some people here, the monks, they have done this chanting the whole night. The child grew up as a very healthy young man. He didn't die. Lived up to the maximum life. And another occasion, Alavaka, the demons or the cannibals or the uh, one who wanted to kill the Buddha and eat, that, I, that lady who tried to <laughs> eat my finger. <laughs> so, the king has promised to send 
somebody, one person every day. This man, this devil, can eat one human being one day, just like small chicken. One day, one human chicken. So, on that day he has sent the child. For his protection he is doing this. Because the devil said, if you break your promise, <laughs> I come and catch you. So for his own protection he is sending, one by one. So before that, the Buddha approached. He wanted to kill him, did not work. He become, he is powerless. The Buddha is more powerful. You know, he had various techniques to approach a different person. We know that he is the most compassionate, very kind person. But on certain occasion, he had to stand like giant, very strong. According to the mentality of that particular person. So he wanted to torture the Buddha. He obeyed him three times. Fourth time when he was asked to do that, uh, then he stood the Buddha, just like a giant. He said, he raised his voice. He said, I am not going to listen to you. You can do anything, whatever you like. Uh, then, this devil got frightened. And who is this man, actually, who got the courage to talk to me like this? Because of that, he had to surrender. And again he changed his attitude. He's all right. Now I am going to ask some question. If you are not going to answer my question, again, I split your heart. I take you from your legs and throw to the other bank of the river. There was a river nearby this place. Again he raised the voice, the Buddha. And you read, here it is in this book, what he said. He said, <coughs> he raised his voice and said, Nakwa hantang also pasami sadevake loke samarke sas samara brahmaniya pajaya sadeva manusai. <laughs> he said, you must understand. There is nobody in this world, in this universe, either in heaven or hell, anywhere, who can do that to me. Do you know that? Again he got frightened. He said, who is this man? And he said, not necessary to talk too much. If you have any questions, you can ask. Ah, then he asked. Kinsu the Vitang Purisasa said Tan, Kinsu Sichindo Sukumavati, Kinsu Have Adu Tarangrasana, Katanji Vindi Vitama said Tan. Very interesting discussion. Uh, then the Buddha started. Sadhi the Vitang Purisasa said Tan. After that, surrender. Uh, then he said, I want to become one of your followers. Paid respect. Meanwhile, uh, that child was brought and offered to him in front of the Buddha. Now he feels very shy and very funny. You know. So he accepted the child and handed over to the Buddha. And then he, the Buddha, while holding this child, he said, Digha yuko ho tu ayang kumar tuan chayak sukito bavahi. 
child, my dear child, may you live long, dighai high Prabhu. Tuanche yakka, yakka means devil. You also, Sukito Baba, may you be well and happy. Refer to the devil. Ah, that is the end of the story, settled everything. And he blessed the child, the Buddha uttering this word, Dighai Poho Tuayan Kumar. So one day, the Buddha was very sick. Then, one of the disciples, known as Chund, Maha Chund, it is here in this book, he went to see the Buddha. And he heard that he, the Buddha was very sick. Then he asked, how are you? How do you feel? Uh, then the Buddha says, severe pain, intolerable. Hmm. Then he said, Chunda, why not you recite this Sattva Bhujang here? A sutra. Recite Satta Bhujang. And then he started to recite. The Buddha was listening. After these recitals, Chunda asked, How do you feel now? Ah, said, I feel very much better now. It does not mean that the Buddha has never heard this, his own preaching. First station that he wanted to encourage others also, because if the Buddha also paid attention, invited to come and recite for him, what about the others? Because that sound vibration change the, the, the elements, energies of the physical body. That is how people experience some sort of relief. Elements also energies. When we analyze all the elements, in the end remain as energies. So the, we, these energies are the thing that we try to influence. This I have seen in 1975 in London. When I was there, we were invited to go and chant to a Buddhist scholar, Pali scholar. Mr. Hegel. He was the Secretary General of the Pali Tech Society, the one who translated Pali Sutras into English. He was very sick, having some heart trouble. He was staying very far away, I think nearly 22 miles far away from the heart of the London town. So when we visited, So he paid respect, so three of us. Then he told, Reverend, can you recite these Bhujjhanga Sutras for me? Because he knows, every word he knows, meaning it. Can you recite? I say, can. So we started reciting. And he was listening with folded hand. And so listening word by word, he is acknowledging because he can understand what we recite. He really uh, enjoyed the happiness, a realization, concentration that he developed at that time. I was watching very carefully. Then after our chanting, he was lying down you know, all the while. He got up and sat down. He 
course, you know, I feel, I feel relief, you know, in my body. The happiness, confidence developed it. And understanding. So at that time, they were planning to buy a new house in London. He knew. So immediately he gave a check, a big amount, pounds, as a donation to that temple. Now here, after learning a little bit of Buddhism, people maintain some sort of pride in their mind. Oh, we know all these things. We know <coughs> what these monks are chanting and all this. They are very stupid people, you know. Look at the Pali scholar who can understand every word, how he appreciated. See the way how Buddha invited his disciples to come and chant for him. These are very good examples for us. So we should not think in that way, oh, we know all these things. Oh, if not, we, can, we also can recite. Because when you recite, difficult for you to, to develop so many sources, energies, because you are alone. And only one mental energy there. If there are few monks or some others, all their mental vibration join together, become more energetic force, get more confidence. So many people have not realized this. In certain temple, the monks are sick, uh, they invite this all night chanting. I remember, think about ten years ago, Venerable Narada, one who has written a lot of books, the Manual of Buddhism, Manual of Abhidhamma, and Buddha and his teaching, a big book, and Buddhism in a nutshell, so many books he has. First, in fact, first Buddhist missionary to this part of the world, you know. Uh, he has done a wonderful service. He died, I think, about one year ago at the age of 88 or 89. He was very sick in Singapore. In fact, uh, Sri Lanka government informed the High Commission there to attend to him. If anything happened, ask them to attend because they, the government wanted to give uh, honor for him. He was so serious. But that day we organized an old night chanting in Singapore temple. He could not walk, people carried him in the wheelchair. He was sitting in front of us. Then I gave a talk before our chanting that services that he has rendered here in this part of the world to introduce Buddhism. In fact, he has paved the way for us to come Otherwise, we have no chance to come. He has prepared the ground for us to come and work here. The credit must go to him. He's the pioneer. Mm -hmm. And I gave it. Then when I was talking like this, you know, I was watching, you know, the tears pouring, you know, happiness. The created in his mind. Purposely I did this to please his mind. He could not talk even one word on that day. No voice. Then we started our chanting. After listening for a few hours, he tired, he wanted to go and take rest. Going back. We continued the whole night. Next day morning, he could talk, laugh, eat, uh, see. What are the sources? Energies are there. The atmosphere that we have created, the sound vibration, and we also have done this with confidence, kindness, compassion towards him. And how many monks were there? 
all of them have diverted their minds toward him immediately. So, next day, after the dana, when we wanted to come back, we went to pay our respect. Then he said, I want to offer each of you something from me. The devotees might have offered certain things, but I have not given you anything. So he went on searching everywhere in fountain pen and pocket watch and handkerchief or towel, so whatever he had and given to each monk, happiness. So this chanting, for the last 2,500 years all over the world, devotees and experience. Then, another secret I think I have revealed, why the Buddha words are so powerful. I think you can remember. What is that? It's also important. Before his enlightenment, the determination he has developed in three ways to become the Buddha, determination, aspiration. Mano panidhaya, vak panidhaya, kai panidhaya, three ways. During the first period, only mano, mana, mind, only in his mind, contemplating, thinking, that one day he wants to become a Buddha, that's all. He maintained this for a longer period, life after life. Later he developed further, now that is called walk, when walk means words. Uh, then he started to tell others, I want to become a Buddha. Before that he never uttered even one word. I am working for that. Then the words also that he used without misusing, without abusing, he developed this for a long period. Uh, then come to the last stage called Kaya. Panidaya. Kai means body. I uh, started to work for that. First he developed only determination. Then he developed words. Then action. By using his full effort, he used his body to do good work, good services. Not to misuse his physical body. Do you know how long? But even then, he says, while he was practicing all these perfections or paramitas, occasionally he has violated certain precept because he is not a holy man. He is an ordinary man but virtuous man with a strong conviction such as a killing or stealing or sexual misconduct and I, drinks and drugs and all these things, he has done occasionally. But after becoming the Buddha, when he surveyed the trace back, what he has done during his previous birth, uh, he has revealed some of them, very little bit he has revealed. But he says, one particular precept I did not violate under any circumstances ever since that I have determined to become a good. What is that? Not to misuse his words without telling lies. The most difficult thing for others to do, 
never uttered one word either to mislead others or to harm others or to do gain something for him personal benefit with selfish ideas never uttered even one word if there is some sort of secret hidden powers in the buddha words of this is the very because these words were uttered by a holy man who never uttered a lie in his life not only within that lifetime can we imagine this can you do this even for one day for 24 hours so after his death actually there were very few buddhists at that time during the buddha's time the majority belonged to various other religious group but they too respect they did not accept the buddha's teaching at not very few disciples accepted because take time for them to understand because this is entirely new system new method new doctrine to them as still many people cannot understand why the buddha did not advise monks to become vegetarian still they cannot understand because they consider the our way of life today when those monks go out they don't people don't bring and no such devotees at the beginning go out for their arm round their system is not to choose some particular house that is one of the principle they must go to each and every house should not overlook even one whether they are buddhists or hindus or christians or muslims or it is immaterial that is their principle so nearly 95% of them were belong to non buddhist group but they was asking their food so when they visit their houses they offer whatever they have prepared as their food whether it is vegetable or rice or meat or fish or this makes no difference for their survival at that time it is very important no such organized dana at that time the early part of the life people cannot understand this thing so after his death one week after his death the dead body the king also came he was not a buddhist but pay respect the dead body is carrying out huge crowd assembled just to see mostly non buddhist but one voice irrespective of their religion they said ah uh, here this is the dead body of a man who never uttered a lie uh, this is the credit that they have given to him do you think people say the same thing when we die <laughs> they may say he is the number one crook you know <laughs> although thousands of people assembled to attend the funeral this fellow is a number one crook <laughs> and that is the credit that we gave <laughs> so <coughs> the power of the buddha words but that is not enough our devotion confidence in the develop with these powers immediately you can see one day a indian he was working in the ministry of home affairs secretary general brought his child 
you say for three days this child did not open his eyes. I don't know what is wrong with doctors also say nothing wrong. So they brought this child. So I went there, gave some blessings and a little bit of water to drink. Immediately after that, just front of the Buddha image, this child opened the eyes to the parent, this is a miracle. Of course, today some others also perform this kind of miracle. They are ready-made ones, you know. <laughs> Earlier they apply something to close their eyes, go there and perform some sort of conversion ceremony. Ah, here, open, ah, open. Oh, see, see the miracle, the God, <laughs> open. <laughs> there are no such tricks. <laughs> so, so I have given many reasons for you to understand why these recitals are important. Then the second question is, uh, how can we experience some good result if we cannot understand what we recite, the language problem? That is why in other countries like China, Japan, Korea, Mongolia and Taiwan, they use their own language. They have translated this into their own language and chant. There's no harm at all. They can understand what they chant. But our belief is that these words are the Buddha words uttered by the Buddha, the language spoken by the Buddha. So we try to follow the same style, same language, same word. To understand the meaning, the translations, I will. Now this is our system that we maintain for more than 2000 years. Another clarification. There are some scholars, some educated people, who have written even in their books also, to tell others that the Buddha did not preach in Pali by using the Pali language to show how clever they are. That's, that is the only idea. Otherwise, by telling that, they cannot do any service to Buddhism. The Buddha did not use the Pali language. Uh, this can create a lot of confusion in others' mind. People lose confidence. Oh, these are not the Buddha word. The later his disciples might have written all these things. Create that in their mind uh, to clarify this. There were six languages at that time. Surasena, Paisati, Apabransa, Magadi, Ardha Magadi, Sanskrit. Six well-known languages, colloquial, different languages and different district provinces. Today there are more than 200 in India. So, the Buddha has studied Sanskrit and other languages also. And he knew the Sanskrit language is was used by the Brahmins. It is the language of high class Brahmins, religious language, Sanskrit. Very rich language. Even German, English, Russian, when you study very carefully, how many Sanskrit words are there derived from Sanskrit? And here, Bahasa, I think more than 50% Sanskrit word in the dictionary you can see. And other countries around this area, Thailand, Burma, Pali and Sanskrit. 
But ordinary people cannot understand this Sanskrit language. Therefore, Buddha did not choose that language to preach. Then the province, the name of that province where he spent much of his time is called Magadha, Magadha province in northern India. So at that time they used this language. It is not entirely a different language, similar to Sanskrit, but easy to pronounce. Now when you take few words you can understand like karma and kamma, nirvana and nibbana, dharma and dhamma, unarbhava and unabhava, Pali and Sanskrit, Pali and Sanskrit, easy to pronounce. So he had to use that magadhi, the magadha, the language used by the people in magadha province. So at that time, this language was known as Magadhi language. It is mentioned in our book also, Sa Magadhi, Sa Magadhi, uh, this Magadhi language. So, in, even in Sanskrit, and those languages, the grammar, the grammatical, the sentences were not very advanced at that time. In spoken language, people never consider about grammar. Now in our language, our mother tongue, when we talk, we never think of grammar. We can talk without grammar, but people can understand very clearly. And Hindi language also, very easy to understand. The grammatical influence there is a very little bit only. So people can understand very easy. But Sanskrit is very hard. So in this Magadhi language, the term, explanations given by the Buddha is very simple. The way of talking is very simple. Uh, this you can understand. When you read one discourse, one sutra, you can see the same thing going on repeating again and again and again and again and again and again in one sutra, sometimes ten, ten places. That is their way of talking. These sutras are not essays written by the scholars to show the style of the language and easy to remember. So, carried out for nearly 500 years in oral tradition, in memory by the disciples, Arahantas. Remember, these disciples are not like ordinary monks, they are Arahantas. Their minds are pure, completely pure. Their memory is remarkable because no other worries in their mind. And they have divided different sections, group by group, to maintain. And the teachers, they always maintain, now it is our duty to train our disciples. I went on like this for 500 years. So after 500 years, when some problems and difficulties and what you call famine and disasters, they decided the time has come for us to record, write down. Before that, no written record. Even in Christianity also, during the Jesus time, there was no written record. Everything was written by St. Paul, St. what you call St. Augustine and uh, Luke and Marx and all these disciples. But amongst all those disciples, St. Paul was the learned one who influenced philosophical teaching into Christianity. And Hinduism, Vaidika, Veda, Dharma also, 
not recorded, not written at that time. Recorded ones we can find few hundred years after the Buddha. But Hinduism or Vaitika Dharma existed few thousand years earlier, but no written record or anything in memory. So they have decided to record. 